also be keeping time so that we can get us on track to make sure that the work group members have sufficient time for Q and A. Um, so if you go past three minutes, and I'll be I'll be putting up little time signs as well. So I will cut you off. Okay, thank you. And I'm going to pass my hand up down to one of the Anna White hands. <laughs> just do your hand hands. Um, so I just want to give a little bit of introduction to the work of the Metropolitan Council and how the council fits into the overall conversation around uh, when I think about density and development patterns, particularly in the Southern County area. So the Metropolitan Council does work only in the Southern County Twin Cities area of Anoka, Hennepin, Carver, Scott, Dakota, Washington, and Ramsey counties. Within that area, we function as a planning agency working closely with local governments, so cities, townships, and counties, particularly in terms of their long-term comprehensive planning. So under this Metropolitan Land Planning Act, every decade, cities and townships are responsible for updating their local comprehensive plans. And then the Metropolitan Council has a responsibility of reviewing those plans to ensure that they conform to the council's metropolitan systems plans, that they are consistent with the council's housing policy in this area, and that they're compatible with the plans of neighboring jurisdictions. Of the most of interest to this work and some of the uh, aspects that turned up in the handout that I received, regulations and barriers to production, um, is the conversation looking at density. So in the council's system plans, we set out minimum requirements for density of new development. So within the parts of the region that we have connected into the Metropolitan Wastewater Disposal System, we have an expectation that new development has an average net density of three units an acre. If communities are meeting this through a mixture of how they're guiding land for single family development, how much land they're guiding for multi family development, and an overall mix of those two pieces. Cities are also responsible for a housing element in their local comprehensive plan, which under state statute is broadly defined as understating what the existing housing needs are, what their projected housing needs are looking out into the future, and how are they using fiscal tools, housing programs, and specific actions to meet what those existing and projected housing needs are. So that's a specific aspect for which we are reviewing local comprehensive plans. And specifically, we're looking to see the cities are guiding an adequate supply of land <clears throat> to meet the needs for new development at at least eight units an acre or what we call the allocation of affordable housing need. Again, recognizing that there's an overall mix of both what the density is of new development and a mix of what the density is that could um, meet needs for affordable housing, specifically affordable home ownership. So the handout that I distributed um, gives some images of what different levels of density actually look like as a way of correcting um, assumptions about what higher density housing actually looks like and that there is a mix of what that looks like and how that fits into existing neighborhoods. And in my concluding comments, I'll talk about what we're seeing in terms of how local governments um, are responding to this and what's in their comprehensive plans. But I can cut off. <laughs> Thank you, Libby. Yes, Thank you, Libby. So um, these guidelines that you put in place, the guidelines that you put in place, when you're talking about how effective has it been to create affordable housing because we've heard testimony about a real shortage of inventory and is it working? Is there something else we can do? What we what we know is that having cities guide land um, at higher levels creates opportunities for affordable housing to be built. But there's simply not enough um, whether it's funding or local will to fully take advantage of this. So we're a planning agency. We're um, looking at how cities are going to land, what is in their comprehensive plan. That is a necessary but insufficient part of the puzzle. Um, so 
we can work with cities to encourage them to have the opportunities for higher density housing, but there needs to be um, the funding through Minnesota Housing, through some of the council's work, um, federal government, there needs to be the will, whether it's mixed income housing policies or rental or single family. Um, land is not enough, but it is necessary. So by funding, you mean actual funding for the developer themselves for the project or for the end buyer? Um, it can work both ways. So, yes. Uh, and do you notice the big shortage of inventory also? Is that in most of these communities, they're all having the same issue? Um, one, of the, um, one of the things that we know is just looking at the sheer number of new housing units that we've seen in the Twin Cities area. So we collect the total number of new units. We have a time series since 1970. Over that time, there's been about uh, 13,000 units a year. Since the recession of 2010, we have not picked up to that level. So looking at the number of years of all of the units, we're just behind. We're far below what the average case of new construction at all price points have been within the seven county area. So I think in terms of meeting past patterns, we are getting we are 10, 15, 20,000 units behind at all price points in new units in the Twin Cities region. And I'm sure other people on the panel will have more thoughts about what's behind that. Um, but we are seeing, uh, we have one of the lowest vacancy rates in both the rental and the owner occupied market of any of the large metropolitan areas. I just was wondering if you had uh, layered the 1970 data moving forward down to a population growth in the same statistical area. If we looked at how the population has grown over that time period, um, when I say that we're behind by 13, 15, 20,000 units, we're a much larger region than we were in the 1970s. We more than two million people yet. So as a relative, relatively speaking, we'd be even further behind on the rate of new construction. And um, then that has influence on how many people are moving to the region, what's happening in terms of household formation. Um, I think it's an issue. I have a request of Mike and Terry, if we could have the three minute opening statements from each of the speakers, because then that way, as questions come up, I think we'll be maybe able to get the different perspectives from each of the speakers. So if, if uh, can we move on with Heather and Brooke, right? I'll use this one since it's on, that So I'm obviously not me from Bemidji. Uh, he wasn't able to stick around. He was here yesterday for a December event. So I'll put my microphone a little bit closer. Is that better? Yeah, a little too much. Okay. Um, so the League of Minnesota Cities, for those that aren't familiar, is a statewide association for the 833 out of the 853 cities around the state. So there's about 20 that aren't technically members of our association, but we still try to help them. They're very small cities. Um, we work on a variety of issues, obviously. We have a lobbying team. We also provide insurance to most of the cities in the state, in addition to training new city council members and city staff members. So um, that's just our little elevator pitch. I don't know, about less or more than half of those cities are less than 5,000 population. So I think the other thing to keep in mind is you all have been discussing housing issues is the variety and diversity of cities across the state and the capacities and um, staff and um, elected officials obviously vary around the state too. Um, this has been said, I think, in other work groups, but just to reiterate the role that cities play in housing, obviously we're not direct developers of it. It's a private market activity that um, involves a lot of stakeholders. Sometimes cities are involved as a convener of those groups. Um, 
and we play a role in facilitating the planning and zoning and land use uh, regulations, um, and local decision making around that. We also get involved in code enforcement, rental licensing, subdivision regulations, building permits, and building inspections. Uh, the league has been involved in the past based on our cities, what we've heard from cities needing more resources around single family um, building more and rehabbing the stock that currently exists, rental housing, both affordable and um, what the league has sort of used as our term for market rate workforce housing um, with a couple of bills that were passed last session and a continued support for state funding across all kinds of money to provide cities flexible tools that help address the housing needs of their community. I think I'll stand for uh, questions and discussion after we go there. Yeah. Sure. Uh, my name is Rick Packer. I'm with Ghana Homes and Remodeling. Uh, just a small insight or short insights. We are a weird, uh, uh, building company, uh, locally owned building company here in the Twin Cities. Uh, deal primarily uh, in upper end markets, single family, uh, detached, uh, either townhomes or uh, just your traditional single family home. Uh, the lowest price range we operate in is under another sister company called Stonegate Builders. And uh, with that type of building method, we might be able to get you in a, most markets down to around 450. Still not the type of housing that anybody is talking about here. Uh, I was a city planner for 10 years back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, I served uh, on the Met Council for five years under Governor Carlson, and I spent uh, the last 30 years uh, working in the housing and development industry with a small respite when the housing market crashed and went and built wind farms all over the United States. And nobody likes wind farms either, so <laughs> I'm used to being uh, disliked. So um, and I don't know, I, I will just go over this quickly. So, uh, Katie, were you going to uh, pass on the stuff that I sent later? Okay. Everyone has every, all of the handouts. Okay, good. Uh, I'm, so I'm just going to go rip through my, uh, my presentation quick, quickly here, but I've been out of this uh, venue for a while, uh, you know, uh, talking and being an advocate for affordable housing and different types of housing market. I haven't participated in probably for the last seven or eight years, but it's astounding for you to come back and, and read your uh, paper here on the uh, regulations and barriers to production for uh, affordable housing production. And I could have written this back in 1978 when I was a planner for the city of Grand Rapids. Nothing's changed. And that's really disappointing. I think it's disappointing to me, and it should be disappointing to anybody who cares about this issue. Um, so I think it's clear that we need to take a little bit different approach. Um, I think we failed to to affect change uh, in the health of our housing chain. I think we all realize here that housing is a chain. Uh, we, we can't produce it new anymore at the beginning and entry level. Uh, and so we need to switch gears and begin to start to think about alternative ways of doing that. One of that is through uh, more intense uses of our existing inventory or varied uses of our inventory. And then probably getting out of the mindset that everybody needs to own their own single family home. Uh, there's nothing wrong with living in a rental unit that's well maintained and well run. And uh, we need to begin to accept that fact uh, because it's just a limited amount of money to go through. Uh, building code changes are the most severe um, and have the biggest impact at the entry level of housing, which is where we're. Needed. So we have to look at, uh, rather than exempt uh, big expensive homes from excessive regulation like the governor did with his uh, sprinkler ban, uh, we need to do it the other way around and begin to accept some of these codes that, that aren't a real threat to health, safety, and welfare down at the lower level. Uh, and I, I touched on we need to uh, begin to look at our existing house, housing resource more than, than we have. That's the best thing we have on the ground uh, to provide an affordable housing. Uh, probably even work on cities as to how we might be able to use it, like granny flats and things like that. And then the uh, the other thing, uh, my Northfield over here, if anyone recognizes that name, uh, he would tell you that we have, we have really failed to address how we deal with concentrations of, of, of lower income, affordable, subsidized, whatever you want to call it, workforce housing. And we need to be able to deal with those kinds of because they are going to occur. That's the way the inventory of the ground is, that's the way we build it. If you can't begin to 
share ourselves with some of this political correctness and, and begin to deal with how we manage these uh, areas, then we're, we're just going to fail, continue to fail. Do it. Thank you. Scott? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Scott McClellan. I'm the Director of Construction Codes and Licensing for the Department of Labor and Industry. I have been with the state in this similar capacity probably for the last 38 years or so. I've been through nine different adoptions of the building codes. So I've dealt with any history and continuity here that might be helpful today. When I entered the field some 30 years ago or so, the codes were smaller, they were fewer, but we also built with Greenfield, cast iron pipe, rafters, floor joists, which we don't see today. Today we have engineered lumber, new materials for plumbing, uh, all kinds of new materials, and that's why the codes do change, and that's why often home builders want us to continue to adopt the most recent codes that we can that don't provide any onerous expectations, but that do recognize the latest materials. Um, I'd just like to draw your attention to the booklet that I published. You don't have to actually turn there now, but on page six under legislative intent back in 1971, when the original charge for state building code was created, I just wanted to read a preamble, which Britain had mentioned of not a lot change, frankly, since 1971. It says many citizens of the state are unable to secure adequate housing at prices or rentals which they can afford. Such a situation is contrary to the public interest and threats to the health, safety, welfare, comfort, and security of the people of the state. Other persons in commerce and industry are also affected by the high cost of construction. Construction costs for buildings of all types have risen and are continuing to rise at unprecedented rates. That was written in 1971. There we are in 2018. And as you said, Rick, not a lot has changed. It's a, it's a volatile, sensitive market that our whole economy is premised on. And again, just briefly, without reading to you, our statute that is established for what our state building code is supposed to look at, look like, I want to read to you, but it's again in the book, but it's supposed to be, we are supposed to amend the state code of construction, which will provide basic, uniform, and reasonable standards. Extremely subjective, but you get where it's going. It also says that the code shall provide for the use of modern methods, devices, materials, and techniques which will in part tend to lower construction costs. The construction of buildings should be permitted at the least possible cost consistent with recognized standards of health and safety. So that's our charge, and that's what we attempt to do every time we adopt a new code. And without getting into so today, my intent would be hopefully to provide some facts and clarity on fees related to the cost of obtaining a building permit and the cost of going to regulation. And I can go into that a little bit later. All right, Richard. Thank you. Uh, my name is Rich Forsler. I'm a partner at Baker Baker Daniels, and my practice is primarily as a lobbyist of the capital. So Senator Gray has had the pleasure or pain, I'm not sure what you would say. Cool. Cool. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I'm here on a kind of a narrow issue, but I think an important issue is it's about condominiums and townhomes. Um, I represent the Minneapolis Downtown Council. One of the goals of Downtown Council in the city of Minneapolis was to double the number of people living downtown over a period of a decade. And uh, that, uh, that was stated um, in the late, uh, I think late 2011, basically about 2010. Um, and actually we've built a lot of housing, multi-family housing in the downtown area. Um, but as the downtown council and its members started to you know, follow this issue more closely and pursue the goal, uh, what we found is that most of that was rental housing. And there seemed to be a strong demand for condominiums, uh, but not many being built. So to make a long story short, um, we brought together a bunch of developers and a bunch of contractors. Um, we got great help from the Met Bond Council, uh, from Libby personally, actually. You can see Met Council sourced of these materials. They were really helpful in getting us to understand uh, the magnitude of the issue and also maybe some of the costs. And basically what we found is that developers, construction companies, architects came forward and said, we'd love to build condos. There's a strong demand in the marketplace for condos, particularly affordable 
towns, which are along with towns, kind of an entry point of ownership. But uh, none of us are willing to take the litigation risk. So what had kind of developed over a fairly long period of time, 10 or 15 years, is that uh, developers built condos, found that they were just, it was like clockwork. They were going to get sued in year eight or year nine. There's a 10 year statute of limitations that applies to construction defects. Um, and basically, um, every condo project in year eight or nine, um, you know, gets uh, advice from the rental associations that we've got to do an inspection, statute of limitations about to expire. We have some law firms who specialize in this area. We have some engineering firms who specialize in the inspections. There's really kind of an industry built up around this. And so basically developers were saying, you know, it's just really kind of a complicated issue to try and deal with the condo association and all of the owners with regard to their concerns about construction defects. It takes a long time, it's a cost a lot of money. We're just building a rental. So ultimately that led us to pursue some changes at the legislature. Uh, one of them that was suggested that we rejected was to reduce the statute of limitations. We did not you know, address the 10 year statute, that's still there. Uh, but you're gonna see on this chart, I'm gonna try and help you go through it quickly, there's a lot on here. We use this as a handout of the legislature. Senator Graham, I think, has seen it before, but no one else probably has. The top charge from the Metropolitan Council shows only multifamily. There's no single family owning homes in that chart. The blue is the development of rental property over a period from 2007 to 2015. Green is co op, which is a very small part of the marketplace. Mostly those are senior co ops. And then the red is the owner, you know, owner of multifamily. Condos. Uh, so the, the real line I think to look at um, is the thin red line, to use a famous, famous book title. Um, that shows the percent of multifamily that was a condiment's owner, you know, owner occupied percent. And you'll see, you know, the right the right side uh, vertical axis shows the percentages. So it was up between 20 and 25 percent in 2007, kind of held there until the recession. Of course, all development dropped dramatically during the recession. Um, but as this blue uh, graph grew, that's the rental property that's being built. The percentage of condominiums built was still very, very low, you know, 2015 to low 5 percent. Um, so, and you can see in the chart, kind of a summary of 2007 and 2015. Uh, new units that includes single family. You can kind of see what's going on there over that period. Um, and then in the bottom uh, is a summary of the legislation that was proposed. Um, a bill was adopted with very strong bipartisan support of the legislature and signed by Governor Dayton. So, current law that you'll see over here on the left side, um, and then proposed changes. All of the proposed changes were adopted in the new law except for the attorney's fee provision, the fourth one down. Uh, the Minnesota Association of Justice, the trial, the trial bar strongly opposed uh, changing that attorney's fee provision, and ultimately that was left out of the legislature. So the new law went into effect August 1. We have seen some early signs of condominium projects being announced. We've talked to some of the developers who a couple of them have said, I would, I would have done this at the wrong property if we had not changed the law. I think we have a ways to go. You know, the real estate market takes a while to respond. Um, so we'll see if these changes uh, have a big impact or not. But uh, we're hopeful to think that it will result in some more uh, condo and town home development. This was not just a downtown Minneapolis issue. Once we got into it, we found lots of folks saying, well, in my community, in the suburban, uh, Metro area, I got a real problem with townhomes. I need townhomes. In Rochester, we heard from Rochester, hey, we aren't seeing condoms or townhomes developed either. And then the final point I'd like to make is that most, almost every developer said this is a bigger issue uh, for affordable condos and townhomes than it is for luxury condos and townhomes. So we can still kind of make sense out of the litigation risk in a luxury setting where we've got a fairly high price. Is when you start to try to develop something that's affordable, that you just look at the litigation risk and say, I'm not going to do that. So, thank you. Thank you. At this point, there will be 30 minutes of open QA between the panelists and the work group. And then at 2.35, there will be a two minute closing from each of the panelists.
Uh, this is Mike Barrett is saying, Richard, uh, is there any more proposed legislation are you done? Or is there still more to be done here? Um, I think the group of the developers and of uh, construction companies and architects who were there would say there is more work to be done on the attorney's fee provision. Um, I think the other four changes that were made are all important and I think will help reduce the litigation risk while still allowing condo owners and town homeowners to have a 10 year statute of limitations, to have all the warranties. We didn't change any of that. But there are a number of folks in our group who say somehow we've got to change this attorney's fee provision because it does drive some litigation, prolong some of the cases being settled. Um, so we are not going to come back this year, but I would suspect in 2019 there will probably be uh, able to change that attorney's fee provision. And maybe by then there will be some other ideas about what we can help do. Any of the analysts, Scott, I was going to ask you, I know the building code's going to be a lot of player for cost. It's both of the heading of regulation. If somebody was to change a code, if we were to pick out some codes that we deemed unreasonable, is it even possible to change the code and how would you go about doing that? It's a good question. Uh, you know, codes have progressed and there are, I think there's a misconception that every time we adopt new codes, there's more regulation. That's not necessarily true. The codes do grow, often in size. Some of it's driven by the federal government with ADA energy codes. Most of that is driven by the feds. Local construction codes, we adopt the national, international code series. And a lot of times, just to address the products and methods and materials that we talked about earlier, they're always being introduced and the codes have to catch up. So what have we done in the last 40 years that we don't need today? I'm not sure I have a good answer for that. Uh, you know, you can talk about structural matters, life safety issues. Um, you know, you start looking at trying to parse all requirements that we don't need. It'd be interesting to find out what people would find is that we don't want to. Sometimes I'm asked, how much, if we just got rid of the code, you know, how much cost would we save? And no one knows because what builders have done is they've integrated, you know, accepted practice, which a lot of the code represents. I would venture to say if we took the code out today, 90% of it, maybe more, builders would continue to build that way because that's what owners expect. That's what you know to be safe. Integrating smoke detectors, insulating your house, structural panels, the, the like. Uh, but there might be some other things that you might be onerous, maybe some of the more out there uh, energy code requirements. Sometimes people are in controversy, how much is enough? Energy seems to be the one where there's been a, a lot of input on the, probably the last couple of code cycles. And one misconception on the energy code is that the division of you know, the last energy code we adopted in 2015 was 34% more energy efficient than our previous code. And yet we didn't do that necessarily out of the goodness of the agency's heart. At the time when the codes were coming up, Governor Valenti at the time was asked to sign uh, on with the Department of Energy to receive $488 million of grant money for the American Recovery uh, Rehabilitation Act during the, the recession. And one of the specific conditions that we adopt a new, most restrictive energy code. So that mandate for the agency came directly from the governor at the time. And that's why we have what we have today. Other than that, uh, yeah. I have a question a little bit for Mike, but maybe that can come back this way. What we hear um, is that building codes have um, increased, and that's increased the cost of building, um, impacting homeowners, um, which is. So I guess as a builder, what are some of the codes that you've seen come along that directly, and now we have to charge this much for this added layer of protection to meet code? Um, and then we can, between the two of you, maybe get a better idea of what those things are, if they're beneficial. You know, that's, a, that's probably a real long answer to that question, but you know, the last time the code change came through, the energy code probably had the biggest impact. And it wasn't changes in the insulation requirement for the blower door test. 
and some HVAC equipment. And did it add cost? Yeah, it was fairly substantial. Um, was it worth it? Well, that's a matter of opinion on who you're talking to and who's benefiting from it. But it did. And each time the growth changes, you do see that effect on the price. But there's typically a trade off. You get something for higher efficiency equipment, healthier environment, um, you know, some green on stuff that has come through. But in the end, it's going to add some cost. There's just no way around it. But uh, so it's a it's a fine line as a builder in what how you take some things out and how can you go backwards. It's like building a car without seatbelts. You know, it's cheaper. But you know, adding on that stuff. You're exactly right. It, it, and again, I monitored this for 35 years and looked at the adoption of the new codes. And frankly, most regulators like simple, short codes. It's less to know, easier to enforce. And as the codes have grown, it's become more complicated. It's not a matter of just looking at a floor choice anymore and looking at the span charts. You've got to have a manufactured product to know what it's designed for. So even beyond the code, it is a lot more complex. Although in the end, these new products save the builders by using high choice trusses over so and so on. So I'd be very interested too from the home building community if there were things we would look at bottom line, what would those things be? And that is difficult. Scott, uh, do they take cost into consideration as they change these codes? Another good question. The model codes are produced by member states, cities across the country. They have no specific charge that the codes be cost efficient or effective. They produce a document that they think will work. They've been lobbied by industry to recognize new products and methods. And then they're produced and people can adopt them. We have a specific in Minnesota statutory charge to make sure they're basic, reasonable, cost effective, and even tangible or construction costs. So we do as an agency have the responsibility to filter all these new codes through that statutory language. And if there's something in there that seems off the charts, it's our job to say, you know, this is this is out there. And our work groups, we are actually in the process of evaluating the next set of codes in 2018. And we have 10 different work groups comprised of industry bikes on one of them. So look at those new codes. Every single change is what we've committed to this year. In every one of the codes, we create spreadsheets. I think with the residential code, there's 170 changes. No. Probably most of them are clarifications and added charts for other products. But we want everyone to know what those changes are so there's no nothing slipping in there that might add some cost that was unintended. So we are looking at that process and trying to guard it the best that we can. Probably in one respect, some of these things just sneak up in the electrical code, for example. Every year there's new technology that's introduced and said, this is really great for septical. Let's now require it throughout the house. And then next year they come up with a new technology. And before you know it, there's some added cost. Grace, safety devices. Plumbing code might have some subtle increases, build like those, some very small ones. And you add those up and the cost does go up over the years. You know, some incremental. Yeah, they do add up. So I've got a question for um, probably Rick Heather and maybe me. You know, as we travel around the state and talk about product and different product, there's a theme there that we need different product, whether it be density or different style, and, uh, and how the communities are adapting to allow this new product. Can you tell me some of the barriers in a lot of these communities to bring new product to the market as far as a different density, different style, granny flats, multi-generational housing, and other items? What are, what are the big barriers to bringing this? to market. Okay. <laughs> uh, and to be clear, I work for a builder and a developer. Uh, but I get uh, my ears filled with them from my building colleagues and I talk like one. Um, I we can't forget I, I hand out some kind of in the weeds type of stuff uh, for you all to look over and, and Casey has my contact information, so we can call me if you have questions. I'm assuming that the spreadsheets and all that stuff. I actually went through all the development costs uh, of a development uh, in, a, in a pretty standard uh, suburban community. And uh, by the time you get done with land, the costs of a lot 
lot, these were 65 foot wide lots, um, where it was $175,000. Uh, so that's where you're starting from. And to get a house financed um, using today's financing ratios and things like that, you're going to look at basically one part lot, three part homes. So if you take that 175 and multiply it by four, you're going to look at what the cost of the home is that's going to go on that lot. It's 65. We, we banned the project. We were trying to hit a market that was substantially below that. Uh, but the costs are uh, substantial. Uh, I think that the, uh, I, I, Mike and Scott uh, kind of alluded to the fact that these costs are, in and of themselves, aren't, aren't a ton, but they begin to snowball. And I think they snowball more than, than anybody wants to say and, and maintain a friendship with people. <laughs> but but I, I can see in the land development business that these costs, I mean, land is being taken away from private owners um, by regulatory agencies um, at, at, the, at the pace that we just haven't seen in the past. Um, environmental regulations uh, are now, and you see them, that energy is preeminent when it comes to building a house. Nobody talks about housing affordability as even a consideration is energy or stability or safety. Affordability just doesn't there. When I say preeminent, I mean to the exclusion of all other you know, considerations. And I see it when it comes to uh, in particular water resources. It's probably the biggest thing that as developers we have to deal with these days. Um, a wetland is a wetland is a wetland, no matter how size, no matter how it is degraded, no matter its quality, um, it holds the same level of priority <coughs> as a very special wetland that we would all recognize as a wetland that wants a dust. And uh, but so then you take these wetlands who are protected by us under waters of uh, the United States, and then watersheds, and they decide what they're going to do with them. And they then take buffers around these wetlands and, and apply and apply them. And these wetlands have no scientific basis, generally speaking, but range anywhere from 16 and a half feet to 75 feet. And they just, basically, you can't use that land. And in many cities, you even have to set back your structure from that setback. That lowers the overall densities. Nobody gets credit for it. And the cities charge you their fees, which are generally in the neighborhood of twelve to $15,000 an acre uh, on those buffers. And so it just it becomes just very uh, sneaky how all these things that uh, and, and our stormwater fees in the last five years uh, for all types of things related to uh, water quality management have quadrupled, and they are now to the point where that is the driver of uh, development. It's not sanitary sewer like it was for decades. It's not stormwater, and, uh, and, and that is what we deal with. And look. So that, that's what I see. I've got a whole lot of those other examples, trees, you know, a renewable resource. So, so Rick, I was just at a meeting this morning, and the question was brought up, well, if that's the case, just raise the density, make the lot smaller. Why don't we do that? I mean, why, what are the, the, the issues that are still well, sort of the cost that should be yeah. applied to me? <laughs> that would be my response. Um, but, but sure, but, but you, uh, density is like a tail wagon. It's like a dog chasing its tail. The more things you get, the less valuable, typically, as a general rule, the piece of property becomes. Right? And then, sure, a condo downtown, you know, it's a whole you know, different story. But a 65 foot wide lot, which is you know, smaller than that, an 80 by 135 foot wide lot, is less valuable. Okay? So you make it more dense, but it's also less valuable. Um, and the house that goes on there has to be smaller. Get to this, but a lot of watersheds now only allow you a 35% impervious surface coverage. That includes your house, your deck, your patios, your drivers. It's a sneaky way of regulating density. Um, and even if you preserve half the site, they don't come back. It's still an individual uh, lot of impervious uh, coverage. Um, I wonder how far I wanted to be with you, Mike. Well, that was what I was after. That's, that's a theme that keeps coming back. And well, if the water quality stops your density, the other environmental Regulations stop density dead in its tracks. What about regulations, zoning regulations in communities? I mean, I've been through quite a few different communities lately, 
And I think every one of them is talking about updating their comprehensive plan. And this seems to be a process that takes, while well, Rochester and State take literally years to do requiring special zoning, special districts. And I'm kind of interested in the League of Minnesota cities. Everybody seems to be creating a wheel. I mean, is there any common knowledge or use that we can, um, proven ways that we can distribute amongst all these great Minnesota cities? Yeah, so I mentioned that we provide training and resources to city officials and city staff. That would include local planning and zoning staff. Um, we have a bunch of research memos on different um, layers of the law that apply to cities, including some of those regulations. I don't know. I don't claim to have read all of our memos on all of our topics, but um, I know things like tiny houses and other Newer housing models have come up at our conferences in the past. And so cities do learn and, and talk to one another at those events too. Um, and I think we know more about this too, but I think the metro area has the comp plan requirement that's not the same um, statewide. So there's kind of why, different, why? different capacities I mean, like for doing that, that lengthy process that you talked about. It was at a conference that we had for newly elected officials back in January. And very small city was had a very eager uh, mayor that wanted to try to um, look at their community vision that had been revisited in over 50 years. And she's just starting down that process, but when you have a um, limited time and budget towards those things, sometimes that becomes, um, you know, and, and capacity for information sometimes too. So those all impact what can be done sometimes. Um, I think, and this goes without saying probably, but since cities have the zoning authority in their communities that's based on the input of those elected officials, which in turn are getting feedback from their residents also. So there is a, a natural kind of cycle of feedback ideally to, to like the needs of the community making its way to that vision. So let me don't throw stones at everybody. Um, Two of the things that you always talk about being the cost of housing, we talked about land. You know, I, I talked about how regulation takes the value of land away. But the Met Council, you know, contrary to public opinion and popular opinion, they're not affecting the cost of land. And there might have been a time back in the early 2000s when the use of land was being advanced at a much slower pace than it should, but they do not affect the price of land. And that burden lies squarely on the shoulders of the building community. Okay. We don't have to buy land. You know, we can all go take a lot of the fishing trip. But our industry is becoming overcome by Wall Street owned building companies who judge a division based on its kind of for one. Based in decisions or its, its value of its division based on the land that they had on the books and projects that they had coming in the pipeline. Whether they worked or not, or whether they ended up dumping them two years from then uh, because the numbers didn't work. We are our own, the building industry is our own worst enemy when it comes to land price with hands down. Um, and then when you start talking about, uh, Heather mentioned these small houses, tiny houses, I like watching them on television. I don't know if I can live on for long for two weeks, but uh, we are our own worst enemy when it comes to encouraging consumers judge the house by its price per square foot. And we all know the builders and developers that the price per square foot goes up the small you make. And so if I'm selling 2,200 square feet, the same thing that the, the guy down the street is selling it for 24, I'm gonna bump my square footage up to 24 so I compete on a square footage basis. But the total cost of the house is going up. So you know, I will I will kick my own industries, but you know, they say we drive up land costs and we train the public that go by per square footage, things like school districts. We don't really have that many crappy school districts in the state. We create some of this problem, and so lest anybody think of just blaming regulation, that it's pretty bad. Well, thanks for picking on me. Part of the job of the task force is to come up with ideas and recommendations. So I'm going to ask all five of you, what are your Ideas and recommendations. I'm looking for silver bullet. 
So I'm hoping somebody wrote so long. You know, I, and Olivia, the question I was going to ask you is that I, I wasn't completely, I didn't understand the, the Med Council and the fact that it oversaw the metro, the, the different areas and all the, the metro. Uh, is there a statewide version of that that might work? Okay, so I'll answer this one quickly. I do want to go back to your earlier question about the barriers to the product as well. Thank you. So in terms of the statewide equivalent, there used to be a state planning agency, Minnesota Planning, that did have some responsibility for working with cities in greater Minnesota on some of the comp planning work. It never had the full um, parallel of the authority to require comprehensive plans in the same way that exists in the seven county area because of the Metropolitan Land Planning Act. But there was Minnesota planning that I believe disappeared. Looking at Heather, was it? I think it was there any venture administration? Sure. No. Because they did have an inventory. It was it an inventory administration and Dean Franklin led it, so it would have been early the twenty years that that the state planning agency disappeared. Um, I taking the microphone to talk about the barriers to new product. The thing that I would say that we really see in looking around the Sun County area is change is hard and innovation is hard. And so there's, when it comes to development, there's a great tendency to rely on what exists. And in terms of who's relying on what already exists, sometimes it's the residents who want to say, I moved into a community and I am the last one moving in. I want it to stay just the way it is when I moved in. Never mind if they're the new resident or someone else who lived there slightly longer. But everyone wants to move in and it doesn't change. That's unrealistic. But when we're making the types of investment that we do in a neighborhood, that leads to a high level of anxiety about change. When some of that anxiety about change gets embedded into whether you think of it as city zoning or comprehensive planning. And we see this at the Met Council because of our relationship with cities and comprehensive planning. Several years ago in 2013, um, we sent out a new set of long-term forecasts to cities in the metro area. What their long-term expectations of population and also growth would be. We heard from a certain number of cities a sense of panic about the numbers. Oh no, we're fully developed, we're done. We can't possibly grow to those numbers that you're telling us. And so the council said, well, there's no local political will for growth. We'll, we'll reduce these numbers. Five years, three, four, five years later, what we're seeing from these cities, most of which are cities that are were developed in the 1940s, the 1950s, the 1960s. Developers are looking at these cities as saying they are well located, they have improved access to transportation, they have opportunities for strip mall redevelopment, and developers are building in these cities. And so we're hearing from some of these first string suburbs in the metro area Hi, can we increase this forecast? Developers want to build here, developers are seeing the capacity and the opportunity. And so, with that sense of market demand, there's an increasing willingness to expand and see more of a mix of housing types than the sense of we are fully developed at three, four, five units an acre, we're done. There's no such thing as being done, but it takes a will to get there. And then, specifically, what we see is we had a program that we called the Liberal Communities Demonstration Account where we're trying to instead innovative development and demonstrations no matter what that looks like. And over the 20 years that we've operated that program, what we see is that what is innovative in a demonstration 20 years ago starts to normalize over time, but it's hard to be the first one doing something new. So 20 years ago, the idea of four or five stories of multi-family rental over first floor commercial was untested, 
And financial markets said, we don't know that that's going to work in the Twin States. We're not building that because that's new, that's different. We don't trust it. So you know, with some investments in some that have been successful, now what we see is that every city said, oh, we want some of that mixed use. And maybe we'll try some mixed income version of it. But I don't know. That's still a little bit untested. So now we're seeing more that are willing to test the mixed income development until that becomes the next edge of what becomes normalized and institutionalized. What would you incentivize this on that program? Money. So, so we give grants to cities who then give that money to developers. Most of our money goes towards the, um, the, the public facing, the place making dimensions of it. But we will give grants of a million dollars, if not more. So developments like Excelsior and Grand in St. Louis Park, the heart of the city created in the downtown of Burnsville. Those are some of the examples of pretty significant investments that we've made. That's precisely what I was going to ask. I'm, I'm very disappointed to learn about the mitigation, but I didn't know that preventing affordable uh, condos to be built. I'm, I come from Europe, so to me, that's a no brainer. That's mixed use things. Why do we have the laws here and the uh, mindset of the single home and no um, services around? To me, it's just so boring. Uh, it's not helping in the communities. I'm coming to went to Austin to the forum yesterday, and that was what people were saying. Um, home ownership in homes is a right, it's for the communities, and all these other actions are preventing that from happening. Right? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Rich and for, or not for Rick, and for Scott. So, um, Rick, on your table, I'm, I'm reflecting on your comments about water management and wetlands. If I look at the first page of your budget worksheet, at the very top, it says net acres excluding wetlands. And so, the very compelling story that you told, um, the, that cost doesn't really show up in a line item. And I'm guessing what you're going to tell me is that it is baked into the purchase price of the land. Because you took however many growth savers you started with, you netted out the wetlands, that left you with X number of lots, and so that's baked in. So just an observation of how do you tell that story um, when it sort of doesn't show up? The, I can answer that, the, the, uh, the wetland uh, in, in that spreadsheet is just taken up. I mean, people recognize the formal wetland regardless of its quality or type. The formal wetland is not counting towards density and they do not charge you park dedication fees, uh, stormwater fees, crop area fees, transportation fees on against the wetland itself. But they will charge you with 75 against the 75 foot buffer that goes all the way around that wetland that is not headed out in that calculation. And that's what I was talking about. You know, the wetland itself I can negotiate you know, myself out of time to pay for the wetland. But I can't negotiate myself out of the of having to pay necessarily that to pay all those fees uh, for the buffer that goes along it. That's it. That may get deeper in the weeds with the homeowner, and it gets harder for the land seller, and it gets just too tough for them to comprehend. But it, it's something the public says we need to save and preserve and set our homes back from. But yet it needs to be charged transportation fees and other things like that. It just doesn't make. And, and a related question, you talked about lot coverage yes. um, as you said, a sneaky way to reduce density. And, and I wanted to just get a sense from you and from Libby about 
how typical are severely low block coverage ordinances, and uh, is there a standard for that? That you know you never want to go above X in certain types of developments. I just it, it, it's just not a concept that I've spent any time thinking about. In, in my trade area in southern Minnesota, we see twenty five percent of the permanent service. Is, is pretty standard. Uh, the bluff line setbacks are, are a real issue after some changes here in the last four or five years um, that people have invested considerable amounts in land and they went and changed the, the zoning, the, the code, or the setbacks, I almost just say setbacks, um, and then reduces the building envelope. Um, or and I've seen in some cases make it a lot not built. So it, it is it is an issue. Uh, and pervious services are, I think, important. I think we do need to have some guidelines. Um, I don't know what the right number would be, but in my area, it's 25. So 35 would be high. Yes, 25% okay. is a number that uh, more rural areas have more affluence in the state. In a DNR protected shoreline district, 25% uh, coverage is is the requirement. However, the DNR is you know, pretty advanced compared to the cities and the watersheds, so they'll allow you to calculate all the land in your development against that 25%. But cities and watersheds, they don't care how much you've given the park, how much land you've preserved that's outside your lots, common open space, or whatever it is. They go on a lot by lot basis. Okay, so the DNR is easy to deal with on a 25%, but a city of 35% is not because they restrict it to the lot. Itself, the formal part that the home is built on. But, but yet, that same city or watershed, if you were to build a town home where the lot is directly underneath the walls of the building and the rest of it's all common open space, they seem to find their way that are in you know, the 25% of the 35% of the whole development. I, I don't, I really don't like watersheds. If you can't tell that. I mean, I, they're, they're worse. I mean, they talk about the Met Council being a member of the unelected body. Watersheds need to be more. Thank you. <laughs> we, we, we've heard a considerable amount about water in the rental uh, group as well, just so it's, it's not just a single thing. It's very good. Right. I don't know what to do. You can't make it go back up here very easily. The water. Rainwater. I have a quick question about the condo downtown situation. Um, when you're looking at doing the condo downtown, does the conversation come up about affordability? Um, um, how what the family group looks like that lives there, so that it's not um, a family can live in a condo still as a starter, um, as opposed to a single person that just wants to have a class downtown. Well, it, as we found out, you know, when we started with downtown focus, we quickly found out that this isn't just about condos downtown, and that is kind of a unique market. It's it's very high land cost there. Um, generally speaking, the market's a pretty affluent one. There's a lot of empty nesters who want to come back to downtown and retire there. They have significant resources. Um, but what we found out is that this is really just as much, and maybe more importantly, about townhomes that you know these kind of folks go out in uh, suburban areas and, and exurban areas um, that can be very affordable um, and can be a, a great place for a young family. Uh, to get started in home ownership. And condos and suburban communities can be very affordable. But I, I think the message, the message of what we found and what we did at the legislature is that, you know, your work is really important. I mean, I think affordable housing is a huge issue for the state of Minnesota. And it's for our rural colleagues, and it's for the urban area, and it's the regional centers. We got a, a big problem uh, with affordable housing. And you know, making condos and townhomes more available can be a part of solving the affordable housing problem. Um, and it can be a part of appropriate family housing entry level. You know, it can work. I think the message of this little story here is that there's a lot of things that get that impact the market for housing and make it less affordable than it should be. So this litigation risk is one of them. Um, 
impervious surface. The surface requirements is another one. You know, you know park dedications uh, and parking. Yeah, parking's a big deal. Um, so I think your, your work, I, think, I wasn't mentioning a silver bullet. I just don't think there is one. I think there's a lot of stuff, and you kind of have to pay attention to everything and do the best to, to afford it. it like what I found out about this issue affecting townhomes, condos, affordable ones, high end ones, is that when you have something that's distorting the market, when you have a litigation risk that is making developers push away from this form of housing, you know, the multifamily owner housing, it not only uh, results in less of that housing being built than there is demand for. But when that happens, the existing housing stock goes up. So if you got big demand for townhomes and condos, but people aren't building them because of litigation risk, the existing ones become less affordable. So I think it's hard work. I think it, it takes a lot of uh, a lot of folks willing to embrace change, as Libby said. Um, our folks talk about density. You know, if you're going to build, you know, these these products that are, they're going to have a more dense impact on the community. There are some communities that are not welcoming to that, um, others that are okay. But um, all these things kind of mix together, and I think, uh, I think you, you got to dig into all of them. And, and that, you know, I'm very happy that you're doing this work. It's really important work. Thank you. Uh, we need to start our closing. Can I just ask Scott a really simple question? What is the current state of play on sprinklers? I know there's been a lot over the last couple of years, and I, I don't remember where the ball stopped. Uh, there was just a little bit of background. The National Model Code, beginning of 2009, required sprinkling of all single-family homes, townhouses, etc. We at the agency said, no, you can't make a case for that. We amended it out. However, we did propose that the largest of homes, 4,500 square feet, due to more difficult fire fire to rescue, higher combustible loading, we tried to make the case that that's appropriate for residential fire sprinklers. Uh, it was appealed, that decision was appealed to the state's appeals court and the Supreme Court, and that was overturned. So today, there is no requirement for single family homes to be sprinklered. But talk about twin homes and towns. And no longer for twin homes and towns. That was last year's legislation. Uh, for two you know, units. For two units, yes. Two unit townhouses or uh, duplexes do not have to have fire sprinklers. But townhomes do. Over, over two units. Three units and more. Right. Two. Right. So I'll, we'll have closing comments here, Richard. I don't know if that was your closing comment. I think, so. I think that was it, yeah. <laughs> Let's just pass the mic down. Yeah. I guess I have my closing. Don't look for the silver bullet. Just pick two, two or three things. Silver buckshot. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, at least. Like I said, I've been doing this majority of long enough that we all kind of say it's, it's just it's too complicated. And if you do it at that, pick a couple of things. I mean, as builders and the people in the industry, we target a couple of things. We don't target the sprinklers. Targeted other things in the building. But there's a whole lot of things that, that get in our way or, or increase the cost of housing, if you will. Uh, you pick a couple. And uh, if you don't pick a couple, you're not going to get you in that. I think one of the bullets that you could look at, it too, maybe hasn't been discussed as much as the rehab of existing products and yeah. there's resources. The tools around that, um, there are proposals for uh, this old house type legislation that differs and improves. Agency looking at the home for a certain number of years. Um, there's other, I'm sure, other ideas out there too. Um, the other thing that's been said many times is more state funding or continued state funding for flexible products around the state. So we don't have to propose silver buckets, maybe. <laughs> a couple of things that we have done since 2015 because of, we didn't see any silver bullet either. One is the agency did purchase online rights to make all of the codes available free to the public. Online, searchable, our website, you can go there. Everyone has free access. Number two, 
through legislation a few years ago, we were in full support of not adopting codes every three years. So now it's on a six year cycle, which gives everyone a breather, time to train, stabilize the market. We thought that was a big thing. We also provide subsidized training to builders and code machines. That's what we have done to date to try to do something. Going forward, um, we would continue to encourage our stakeholders on our work group meetings to guard the code and look for those as we wrap up the process to anything that does increase cost. I would also encourage the industry to get more involved with the adoption of the electrical codes and plumbing codes. No one attends those, those board meetings and those things just come through every year untouched with the input of the public. Building code and the energy code, there's lots of scrutiny but not any other codes typically on state policy. Um, we are adopting an appendix chapter or proposing to that would allow tiny homes and it would kind of um, relax some of the requirements that are in the peer building code, but then it'll be up to cities whether they want to allow them in the jurisdiction. So, So my closing comments would start with, I think there needs to be more housing period. So catching up on the amount of units that we need to keep up with the growing population, more housing, all price points. Inside of that, I want to reemphasize the point that Rich is beginning to make, particularly on townhome production, that townhomes are a route to housing affordability that the market dropped out in the last 10 years. And that is in particular a excellent opportunity to build homes, to build attractive homes at a lower price point. Encouraging cities to allow more of a mix of housing product, getting to Mike's point, whether that's a mix of housing density, a mix of housing price points, a mix of housing types. So encouraging innovation, encouraging variety, and I think Demographics are increasingly encouraging that, so there's a particular opportunity now. And then the final thing is encouraging cities to take more of a role and understand what the options are around particularly expanding opportunities for affordable home ownership. So in our work with local comprehensive plans, we are seeing a particular increased interest in accessory dwelling units at the local level. We're also seeing a mix of cities who don't necessarily know all of the opportunities and what the options are in affordable home ownership. So for example, a conversation with a city who didn't know about the community land trust law and had never heard of that. So there are opportunities to learn more and what the opportunities are and for local governments to partner in ways that really grow housing. All right. Uh, well, I guess Richard comes along. I just want to thank Senator Graham for his support. You know, we have a lot of our legislation, but I know for me and Ron Catholic, that's a lot of work on housing. So it's really important that we have elected officials who pay attention to this and work with all of us to find solutions. So thanks, Senator. Well, once again, we'd like to thank everybody for participating today. That was, that was wonderful. And we are uh, on break.
Uh, we're a Minnesota-based nonprofit organization that helps residents of manufactured home parts to organize, negotiate market-based purchase agreements to buy their parts, uh, raise financing, and then uh, own and operate the parts. So our, our area is uh, manufactured housing. Uh, it's sort of a niche market, but it's an important source of affordable housing. Uh, in the state of Minnesota, uh, there's more housing that's affordable to families at or below 50% of area median income in manufactured home parks than all of the Section 8 and rural development of subsidized housing combined. Nationwide, 70% uh, of homes, so uh, new homes selling for less than $150,000 are manufactured housing. Um, so again, it's an important source of affordable housing. I just want to encourage the members of the task force to take a look at manufactured housing and consider where it fits into the housing picture in Minnesota. And have you taken questions? Are there any questions for us? Uh, I have a question. I was at a actually a meeting this morning and manufactured housing came up and uh, aging parks came up. And one of the issues was the quality of the manufactured housing in the park. And what do they do about that? I guess one thing to fix up that infrastructure in the park, but what about the aging housing in the park? Yeah, so um, manufactured housing um, is a pretty post-1976 term, but prior to 1976, they were trailer homes. In 1976, Congress adopted the HUD code, which is a uniform building code for manufactured housing, and the quality improved a lot after 1976, but there are older homes. Um, the studies that have been done have shown that if properly maintained, a manufactured home will last as long as a site built home. Um, but what tends to happen in a lot of parks is there's disinvestment in the homes. And so, just as you, if you wouldn't invest in your stick built home, um, quality declines. Um, it's, it's an issue. Um, you know, one of, the, uh, one of the problems with lack of investment is depreciation in the, uh, in the value of the homes. Um, the studies that have been done that have shown that in a resident home community where let residents control it, where the lot rents are continually going up, tent homes appreciate in value, so it makes sense to invest in your home. Whereas in an investor home part, um, there's the, tent, the value tends to depreciate, there's not the same incentive to invest. Um, one of the things that NCF is trying to get done, and we're, we're close to doing it, is to do new single family neighborhoods using manufactured housing. Uh, we think there's huge potential for that. And those are, again, beautiful, brand new homes, um, comparable to anything you see out there uh, in the St. Hill market. Sean, um, just a couple of numbers questions. Um, I know the legislature has been hearing a lot lately about cooperatively owned um, manufactured home parks. So how many manufactured home parks in total are there in the state of Minnesota? And then of those, how many are either cooperatively owned or owned in a community land trust? Uh, so there are about 950 parks um, with about 50,000 homes in, them in the state of Minnesota. Um, of those, um, eight are parks that we've held residents purchase either with a cooperative ownership or a nonprofit um, ownership structure. There are a handful of others. The city of Landville all itself is a manufactured home community. Um, Lake City owns a uh, manufactured home community. There are a few others um, statewide. So it's, it's a small number. Yeah, I, uh, I come from North Hill. And, uh, both North Hill and Fairville have a substantial amount of affordable housing through trailer parks. Um, we, are, we are very interested in working with the, the people living there and whatever the city can provide to make them own. And, and, uh, many of them are immigrants and I work with, with the immigrant population. So they're very fearful to do this process probably, but we're going to be helping, so I'm very interested in Yeah, we've actually met with the uh, Northfield Community Development uh, Organization and they've been supportive and we hope yeah. we'll work with them in the future. So we are now full force doing that. That's great. <laughs> Other questions? Thank you. Thank you. All right, the next person I signed up is Jeff Washburn for City Links. Can you land trust? Uh, I also know, yeah, uh, Johnson, who's a Twin Cities captain. 
increase in cost of housing, why it keeps it affordable long term. Um, and then secondly, can you just briefly describe what this bill does? I'll start with manufactured housing. So in the resident ownership model, um, ownership of the land is by the residents themselves. So the only reason to increase rents would be as their costs increase. In an investor-owned model, um, as uh, neighboring real estate values increase, the investor owners capture that increase by raising rents. Um, and that's eliminated in a resident ownership model. Um, the other thing that we do is you know, one of the weaknesses of an, the investor owned model is the private infrastructure systems. And many parts were built 30, 40, 50 years ago. Those infrastructure systems have very expensive, they're useful lines. Unlike with condominiums and townhomes, where state law requires that there be adequate reserves to replace those systems when they fail, there's no similar law for manufacturing home parks. But we set up where those resident home communities, we always establish reserves so that the next time, 30, 40, 50 years ago, when the systems give out, there's money there to replace them. Our model is very simple. Um, we assist families up to 80% of AMI, um, and we keep Housing is affordable because of all the volunteer effort that goes into our habitat home, in addition to the leveraging of public of the private dollars. Uh, we have the first right of refusal. If a homeowner does move out, we um, have the ability to buy that home back and then also fix it up and keep it more. Thank you. Uh, as it relates to community land trust, we, we like to keep things really, really complicated. So, uh, <laughs> well, what we typically do is bridge the difference between what a homeowner can get a mortgage for and the cost of the property. We tie our investment um, to the title of the land in most cases, and, and by doing so, we're able to enforce uh, resale and income restrictions for future resales. Uh, in addition, depending on the community land trust, uh, those resale formulas uh, allow us to capture a portion of the growth uh, in the value of the property. Our, our share of that, 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 that appreciation rolls back into the affordability of the property, and, and we were able to secure uh, those investments made by the state and other uh, funders by utilizing uh, a 99 year ground lease. Um, in the case of, there was talk of, of condos today, uh, and our organization has used a deed restriction uh, in ensuring the long term affordability of, of, of condos. As it relates to, to uh, the bills that are being put forward, uh, what we're looking to do is just to capture the growth in the mortgage registry and the tax each year. So each year we reset and we just look at the growth and we're not looking at changing the percentages or the amounts. It's just looking at what that percent from year to year um, would yield as values go up. And so the, the house uh, research group had estimated those, those increases to be anywhere between four and $14 million a year. And they may change as projections change, but as they look out over the next 10 years, that's what they're projecting uh, for, for this month. I can add one thing too. We do have a 10 year sunset on our request, and that's um, just to acknowledge it. Not, um, not all our stairs appreciate that dedicated source, so just a 10 year effort. Does anyone have any questions for the working group? Okay, thank you. Thank you for your and then the last name I have written here is Charlie Vander Art from Metro Cities. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to comment today. I appreciate the, the discussion. I know cities have a great interest in meeting the housing needs of their community, both now and looking into the future. I think that the town bill, town hall bill that was discussed today was a good place for the committee to start. It's a good example of a lot of interested and engaged stakeholders coming together and saying, here is broad based support for recognizing the deficit that's in our communities. And as um, Mr. Forshler said, we heard from a lot of our suburban communities that this will really help with town home development, which they targeted as a key source of affordable housing, looking at that, that ownership market. I also think it's important to recognize the building code development process is another iterative process. We have a lot of stakeholders at the table. You have those who are regulated, you have the regulators, you have the builders and development community, you have municipal officials, and that's a good chance for a lot of different issues to get heard and raised and then come out with the, the code for, for the state. 
Um, I encourage the, the working group to look at each sector's roles. I thank uh, Heather Corcoran from the lead for stating city roles in her introductory remarks. Um, I think it's really important for the group to look at how each city performs its role is dynamic and it's informed by a lot of different stakeholders and people interested. So you have residents, you have neighborhoods, you have housing advocates, and you have elected officials and, and those policymakers make their choices on zoning and land use decision based on you know the healthy tension that each community has as they develop well, how they want their communities to, to look. Uh, one example I'll give is in response to lot sizes recognizing that land costs are the driver is some cities that I spoke with said, you know, we've decreased our lot sizes, recognizing that affordable home ownership is a need in our community. And so in looking at that, they, they responded by when they when they done subdivision regulations to say, okay, maybe we, we decrease the lot sizes and then make more opportunities available. Additionally, Metro Cities can be the housing forum in 2016 to look at housing needs in the future across the metro region and appreciate uh, our friends at the Met Council encouraging cities to look at their, their roles and what their, their policies are, and that's something that we'll continue to participate in and, uh, and perform for, for our cities. Finally, I'm interested in the handout that was um, part of the materials that hasn't been discussed yet with the regulations and barriers to production. If there's a chance to participate in what that document is and how it involves going forward, that's something I know that um, municipal partners are interested in. And looking at it and participating in it as well. But for cities, happy to submit a city rules and housing document to the task force, and I think that can help weigh how different roles are, are viewed by the task force members of the, full, um, the work group as well going forward. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any questions? If not, um, is there anyone else who wishes to speak? We didn't get a chance to sign up. Here we go. Something's not even that long to the end of our public comment period for today's meeting. So I'll turn over to Mike. All right. Well, task force. Now it's time for us to discuss uh, potential recommendations here. Yeah. But before I do that, I was called. I was told to call attention to. Continue making uh, uh, opportunities for public input. It looks like we're taking the call for this through today. Today, apparently. They're um, going in. They're going in. Yep. And then, uh, in addition, I think we've also done a call for papers as well. Um, I know there's the regional forums. Same thing. Same thing. Okay, well, thank you. Um, the, the regional forums that um, have already happened. I'm hearing a little bit from. Um, um, yeah, the first one happened, and the other ones will be happening throughout the state of Minnesota. Again, um, we're encouraging, um, we've been asked as task force members to attend two, at least one in the cities and one in greater Minnesota. And then there are a couple other community events. Stay tuned, I've been in those planning tables. They're going to be great. And so um, and that we continue to have regular items for input on the website. So all the materials today handed out will be posted on there so that we can share it with our networks. Thank you. Thank you. All right, task force members, time for discussion. Attempts at recommendations. Here's our top four topics here. There are six topics. Um, for some pretty good speakers, we kind of start coming up with some ideas, some recommendations. So. Start. Can I go to the document that um, Charlie referred to, the one that's titled Regulations and Barriers to Production, and maybe have staff talk about what it is and how it would be used in the discussion? I just I don't know its origin and um, what was what what the work group is intended to do. So at um, the first couple meetings, there was a lot of discussion on state and local regulations that um, impact the cost of housing. So our intern, Lydia 
and Ted put together some background documentation and material of some different things that the work group would think about. So this was um, really designed as background information that was provided to the work group ahead of time. Correct. And also the document um, that is available at the table that is the homeownership work group of the Governor's Task Force on Housing, summary of potential topic areas and solutions discussed at previous meetings. This document is really designed um, to just um, detail things that have come up at past meetings, both from speakers as well as from the work group members, and really meant to just trigger some discussion on each of the topic areas. This document wasn't meant to be um, 
fully formal recommendations, but just rather ideas or things that have come up over the first work group meetings, just to help trigger thoughts and ideas as you're thinking about the recommendations that you'd like to put forth as priorities. Um, but we did want to keep these items that to be discussed in round two, just because there's some overlap on there and we're going to be building on those as you bring up different ideas and topics, so you can kind of see how some of these areas overlap. Um, and there will be an opportunity after today as well to really look at um, getting more granular as Terry was talking about, you know, how are you going to prioritize, who's going to be responsible, what kind of additional actions can be taken. Um, and this was not sent out to the group, um, except for Terry and Mike yesterday. It's just, it, it really meant to be just discussion points. And, and just one observation, uh, especially on topic three, since we just heard a uh, testimony on that today, there are a lot of ideas that came up today that aren't on this list. So. You know, you shouldn't think about this as a comprehensive list of topics, um, but maybe just uh, prime the pump here a little bit for your thinking and a little remembering some of the topics we had at the early meetings. So it's these are you know some of these ideas are great big and some of them are fairly little and. Um, so I think just a discussion at this point about, well, you know, what did you think about item 1A? Is that a big thing or a little thing, or should we take it off the list? Um, I think that's a huge, you know, you know, I was really intrigued by the incentivization of, of different product and getting builders and developers and the industry to, to build more of the product we need in the industry. I don't risk it. You know, we're going to take the path of least resistance. We talk about barriers. Uh, developers and builders will continue to do what they're doing as long as they're making money. It's hard to, to change course, especially with a huge amount of risk involved. And I don't know how we can address that. How we could, if it's a state or a local, or maybe it's just the education of the builders and developers of what the community needs. And encouragement. We spoke about that earlier. Encourage the builders, developers to produce this product. And keep in mind that it might take a while for it to go. I'm not sure how we do that. Other members have some ideas. You know, uh, let me make the comment with money. But that's a uh, it sure is easy at all this just to ask for more money. Yes. <laughs> that seems to be coming up time and time again, even in Austin, it can boil down to more money. More money. But I, I truly think we do have to encourage, you know, I'll go back to because I'm from the building development part of it. How do we encourage our young entrepreneurs, young know, builders, developers to get involved in, in the industry and to start building some of the let me also make a comment that we were short inventory. We just haven't filled the gap across the whole housing spectrum. I think that's that's true, especially in our community, for short housing at all price ranges. So how do we encourage construction of that? And what are some of the big barriers to it? I think we touched on that further on as far as access to capital and some other items. But right now I think we've seen some pretty Heard about some pretty good ideas coming forward and some of the housing stuff we need. How we encourage uh, the construction of that? Um, so, as I look through this, I just very quickly, um, and maybe it's just the way that my brain thinks, but I want to consolidate things. I want to, I want to solve for X at all times. So, I just went through this, and all of the items that are under topic one connect to any one of the other topics and under two or three. Does that make sense? So it, you, you could almost rephrase each of the topics under one, each of the subtopics, to say um, address the mismatch between housing inventory and need preferences by um, addressing state building codes and its impact on development costs. The very last um, three 
So, so just in going through and doing that, you really have, because we've spent so much time talking about what the issues are, that I think this, just this front page, because we're not getting to the back side, um, is a good list of what the issues are, and really consolidating those and making it a comprehensive statement, and then solving um, and, and sort of having some solutions underneath those. Um, so just in consolidating those, I have really six topics as opposed to how we're doing it here. Yeah. Uh, that very much are a by doing X, Y, and Z. Parents would say, call up. Call up. So I made the connection between um, topic 1A and 3E. And the connection between 1B, uh, which is financial wellness and ownership education, which is key, um, and also addresses um, you know, some of the disparities. Um, so connected 1B to 1E, 2B and C. Um, from topic one, um, C, support individual development accounts and other savings programs. Again, this is how do we get people in the houses that are so that they're more affordable. Um, that's a connection with D, increased down payment assistance. They're sort of in that same idea. Um, Michelle, because I'm going to, sorry, but as you're consolidating, could you give like a general title for how you consolidate them? I'm going to really make this work as a committee to name things because that's the more work we do now, the less we might have to do later. Sure, so we have. I mean, is it about products? Products, if you had to put a header topic on it? Yeah, one would probably, the first one would probably be products, the housing inventory needs preferences. Um, education. Mm -hmm. um, financing. So keep consolidating. <laughs> That's keep exactly consolidating. Like three, three major headers that I, I think, and again, I can be oversimplified, people accuse me of it. Uh, that, it, that these things would fall under those headings. Um, the down payment assistance, again, is another, like, the savings account, um, increasing and expanding the availability of mortgage products that piggybacks on education and financing. Um, under topic two, examining and addressing the unique needs of immigrants and refugee households um, that was connected back up to financial wellness and closing inventory. Um, and that, that basically was it. That was the consolidation of those, those items into basically six. No. I'm, I'm literally just <laughs> right. Any other thoughts or prior questions? Is it easier? You know, we can do this in a number of different ways. I think that's the thing that's really helpful, right? And writing recommendations, right? And so I want us to make sure that there's kind of a that this is the way we feel like this is a good way to move. Or one way we want to try this, we you know go along and then realize whether or not helpful. I think almost any recommendation can cover a lot of these topics. I mean, if you're improving housing, you're, you're addressing a lot of these, but you almost have to break them back down in order to talk about the specifics. You know, the housing inventory, the needs and preferences, if we're talking about new construction, really boils down to the creation of it. Who's building, why are they building it, where are they building it? From an education standpoint, I mean, that's across the board. I'd actually like to see more here about education of the realtors and the builders and the lenders. I think we missed that big time. We've got a natural conduit to the builders and the realtors.
years to get your continuing ed requirements. The, the one thing that I'll probably stress in the education, you know, you need to get to the finance, the finance part of it is who can develop the curriculum and who can teach it. I mean, we heard in Austin yesterday that home or education is a big deal, but they don't have enough people to teach it. As a matter of fact, one of the, I think it was Jenny from Three Rivers said, you know, we, we, we send the teachers to school to learn the program, teach them everything, and then they leave and move on to another position, which is great because she said in some instances they stay in the industry, one became a realtor, moved on and is helping in that, that same deal. So how do we keep a steady stream of educators and the material. The, I believe the whole honor of education part is available online as well. She can take the same classes and curriculum online. You don't have to be in a classroom setting. So, yeah, I've never, I've never taken any class. I probably should. <laughs> Is that is the is that kept up to date as the curriculum? Yes. Correct. Yeah. Okay. It's the class that people have to take if they're going to get down with the system. I know I've heard of it, but I haven't taken it, but I've heard of it many times. But and then what about education for our realtors and our builders? You know, I just completed both my uh, both a realtor and a builder. I completed all my education. Some of the content. Not say anything bad about any of the providers, but some of the content wasn't worth the time. So part of our fair housing, part of our required module for 2017-2018 is fair housing um, component. There are classes available um, on new construction. Um, you know, I don't take all of the classes. I take my required classes, but it seems like there's a fair amount. Um, I guess the question would be what, what, what the education would be on. I think that the financial aspect is so ever changing because of federal laws, um, interest rates, products that are coming out per bank, that we really as realtors try to stay in our lane a little bit um, because it's easy to advise somebody with the wrong thing. And so it's hard to keep up with the financial aspect um, because it is so ever changing. But as far as building codes, requirements, what's available, things like that, um, I'd like to make you see them. You know, what came up yesterday also was that from a lender standpoint, a lot of uh, the lenders don't have knowledge of all the product, and a lot of the lenders don't want to work with all of the, the yeah. ones, they want the easy ones. So, we have, I, um, we talked about earlier in the one of the ideas of being an online matrix that is across the board very simple to understand um, as well as being comprehensive in terms of what is available um, so that consumers can educate themselves because the more that a consumer is educated, um, the more that they're able to go to the lender and say, I need this product and if you're not going to do it, that's why I'm going to go someplace else. Um, and that's, a, that's a process of one, the consumer being educated and two, feeling empowered enough to be able to take the business to somebody else. Um, and in a lot of these spaces, immigrant, minority, low income, um, they're not in an empowered position to feel like even if they had the information, they're going to walk away and go buy a different loan officer. Yeah. So I think part of that comes with education. I hear so like I'm hearing education can also be for lenders that should be a target population too. Yeah, we've been talking about kind of how to frame the recommendations with the other work groups as well. And like breaking it up into education, finance, um, products might be thought of as sort of tool sets. So there are financing tools, education tools, product tools. Um, and when we're organizing our recommendations, do we go by general topics with strategies and then identify what types of strategies they are? Is it an education strategy, a finance strategy? Or do you instead have your big recommendations? your big recommendations around education and then everything that's an education related strategy is there. So there are different ways you can organize this ultimately and, it, and it's been to start thinking about that. Um, 
slightly cryptic picture is really identifying what you think the priority strategies are, and then we can organize them different ways as we go forward. You know what you were saying is this matrix. It is there anywhere, maybe a nonprofit that has that for consumers, for vendors, for banks. But all those, I don't know if you have the conversation yesterday, agnostic. There's so many products that the organizations, agencies, banks don't know exist. So they cannot offer it. We should have somewhere central for the most state for people to access. And on our, on our MLS site, when we are looking at properties, there is a link that we can click um, that, that shows what products are available for that particular house because there's tracks of land that has particular loans or grants that are available. The uh, problem that comes in with that is a lot of times those resources are gone, so it's not updated the way that it ought to be to be effective. Um, it is a really good model and a good idea because it is per house. At the same time, it's not really intended for lenders. It's intended for consumers who, in a whole buying process, are very overwhelmed already. And I feel like what it does is say, go call these 15 people and see if you can shake anything from the trees. Mm -hmm. um, and so we very quickly can say, well, these five are out of money. Um, you know, try this, try that, which is why. Yeah, so. I would also add that the Minnesota Home Ownership Center um, has a really good product matrix that hits both first mortgage products as well as down payment closing cost assistance with like a link to uh, down payment resources. Uh, that hits both industry professionals plus um, borrowers. But to Rochelle's point, it, it's true there are a lot of local uh, units of government or neighborhood organizations that do have just limited sources of funds that it gets tricky because it can, it can be out there really quickly and people may get frustrated. If they try to access it, they find out that no, that's not available anymore. Casey, do you want to also talk a little bit about some of the training that your service does for lenders and realtors? Sure, and then also just going back to your question as far as the online, um, through the Homeownership Center, there's a network of about 40 different organizations statewide. There's three different types of training you'll see. So home stretch is the classroom, framework is the online training, and there's also one-on-one uh, -on -one counseling that's part of that as well. Um, and as Mary's talking about the work that we do with real estate agents at Minnesota Housing, we do have uh, what's called a real estate partners program. So we have a business development team here at the agency who um, holds um, many, many uh, real estate professional um, trainings that also we provide free continuing education credits. We talk about affordable housing, we talk about opportunities, we talk about buyer education and counseling and all of the available affordable products. So we've been really developing that network and we've reached out to many real estate agents um, and organizations through that process. Um, also, one of the things um, on the licensing side that just passed in, what year was it? Um, as far as the licensing requirement, now there's um, actually some requirements as far as learning about affordable housing, home buyer education and counseling, um, as well as affordable products, and there's test questions. So real estate agents need to go through that before they can um, get their license, which is really exciting for us. And this just happened uh, two years ago, was it, Julie? Yeah, two years ago. So that, that was a pretty exciting thing to really look at some systemic change that could make a difference in requiring everybody to learn about it before um, achieving their license. So that's in their courses before they get their license. Mm -hmm. okay. Is there anything for the continuing yet for the agents that have been out there? Any requirements for that? No requirements um, that I'm aware of, and I'll look to Rochelle, um, but you know, I think having the CEUs. Um, free connected to the informational pieces is, is a really big draw, I think, 
for a lot of real estate professionals. I was just going to say that people uh, we have this conversation a lot about there's just so many realtors. So the realtors that are interested or in communities where affordable housing is necessary are important, and people that are not are not. Um, so the information is out there and available. Um, we do do classes um, and training and, and network and talk about what's available and what's going on in the works and what doesn't if you're in that space. So Michelle, what can we do differently? What can we recommend? What can we do differently to make that better? I really think that the education should be more to consumers than to agents. I think that a consumer that to consumers and to loan officers, um, a consumer that is saying, I I feel like I can buy a house. I want to buy a house. And just that, I want to buy a house. What is the steps? What are the pro what's the process? It's no different than anybody else. It's just making sure that they're able to go through that process and get the information. Um, and so things like home stretch, the people that come in, I teach home stretch classes. The people that come in and teach those classes are informed. We talk about real life experiences. People that come out of those classes, out of an eight-hour class, are way more informed about all the programs, not just through what we're telling them, but from all the different experiences with all the different teachers. Um, and I think, again, the more the information the consumer has, the more empowered they feel. We tell them, go to your local bank, go to the first person that you want to, and if they tell you no, feel free to go someplace else. Shop for an interest rate. If we didn't tell them that, I don't know that people would do that. So I think education for consumers is primary. And expanding that out. And a part of that, too, is really just letting people know, consider it. A lot of what we've talked about is people have the income, have the education, and they're not looking at home ownership because they just don't think that it's part of their path. So introducing the idea that really it is, your credit's not as bad as you think that it is. Let a professional tell you that your credit's not good. Don't decide on your own. Um, and really just introducing the idea of try, think about it, just think about it, and see if it's something that you want to do after you get the information. I think that's what we need to expand out is the idea of considering. But that, that um, so it's not the online class, it's the business that class may attend. There's a there's a face to face version, the class version, there's an online Because from the communities I work with. Online or ever. So it has to be a purpose meeting with them and teaching them over the way. Yep, it's the in person home stretch, and it's also um, many of the providers do it in different languages as well. So there's, uh, yep, uh, in Spanish in many different areas in the state, and then there's other languages, Somali. Somali. I'm just going to our the task force co chair. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can. can. Yeah, we can. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so I just wanted to lift up the, the point that Rochelle made um, about making information available on the individual level um, and, and say that I think that that's a really good idea. You know, um, Minnesota Housing, for instance, has great information about the funding tools that are available, but it's generally geared toward um, uh, funders and, and or realtors. Um, but it would be awesome if the result of this could be some sort of tool where someone who's interested in purchasing and curious to know whether or not they're able to could see um, these are all the tools that are available and here's how I individually go about accessing them. Um, and identifying realtors who are familiar with those tools and able to help me navigate, that would be awesome. Just adding on to this, um, we just, we do a number of outreach events with KFC staff, so we attend um, a variety of community events uh, where that are attended by um, lots of people and have mm -hmm. often times with a realtor um, and what we hear from uh, our staff people who co-staff those 
is it really is having that one-on-one -on -one conversation with a person who in their brain just is not thinking that homeownership is a possibility for them. It's overcoming that, well, you know, maybe it could be. Um, you know, how much are you paying for rent now? And comparing that to maybe how much a mortgage payment would be. Um, and we're also experimenting at Minnesota Housing uh, with a couple of cities. Um, right now, we have a pilot program going on in Bloomington where we're working with the city of Bloomington to identify renter populations within the city of Bloomington, frankly, in properties that have somewhat higher <coughs> rents, so we know that people are already paying a fair amount for rents and doing uh, some social media marketing, et cetera, directly to some targeted renters, um, showing them through marketing materials. We did a little bit of offering the online class um, uh, free of charge to the first 100 that uh, signed up to create a little bit of uh, excitement uh, and then making sure we have links to uh, realtors and uh, loan officers who are in that market area. So I don't know if you want to say anything more about that, Casey, but that's the kind of, it does take that very, very targeted approach. And we're also just starting to work um, along the lines of Bloomington. We're starting to work with the city of Richfield as well as far as a targeted um, outreach to their uh, income eligible renters in, that, um, in the city of Richfield. And one of the pilots that we're working on at the agency is also partnering with our multifamily staff as well to look at, um, to work with one of our developers to provide on-site home buyer education and counseling and information on programs for those renters that may be able to move into a home and then open up another affordable unit for another renter. So that's that's another approach that we're starting to to use and pilot within our within our agency. Yeah, I think that those are are great approaches. I'm curious to know if we've polled. Um, the attendees um, and or done some sort of um, a gathering of information about the, the people who attend, whether or not they actually are um, taking advantage and becoming homeowners? Akua from, are you um, asking about the uh, partnership that we're doing with the developer or are you talking about more the ones that are attending the home buyer education and counseling classes. Yes, the ones that are attending the home buyer education classes. And I, and I say that um, thinking that there may be an opportunity when we do this um, community solutions um, engagement activity in April to, to do some testing there as well, to use that as an opportunity. I wonder, you know, getting at your point, Akua, um, I wonder if the uh, work group would be willing to hear for about two minutes from uh, Julie from the Homeownership Center about mm. the framework product, because one of the things that's happening with the online product, and I realize Mark won't be won't work for everyone, but um, certainly a lot among some of the millennial populations of all races. Um, mm -hmm. that, you know, one of the best ways to keep track of people and whether they follow through is online. So if, if you're willing to hear from Julie for a minute or two, Julie, go ahead. Let me ask you, um, do we have solutions for investments that they don't accept the type of credit we have with interest in other projects? Okay, do you hear that to them? There is, uh, just to say, I, there was, there's been a local group that's been advocating a small draft of their uh, call for ideas that they're going to be presenting. So we'll, we'll see something before us in terms of where um, that adheres to most of the finance tools. Okay. 
Julie, one other thing maybe that you could talk about is the com uh, community engagement outreach and um, leading up to the campaign. Right. So I'll start with the question that Mary brought up, the question of access to online education. So the, the idea of in-person classroom education or higher education has been around for many years. We've been doing this work for 25 years. HUD has been sanctioning this work for far longer than that. So around the country, there are organizations like the network that we work with, like Jenny Larson's group and the groups that you heard from um, several weeks ago, who do this education in a way that's <clears throat> standardized to national industry standards and then delivered in a way that is normalized and professionalized around the country. And it is true that, um, as you heard from Jenny yesterday, access to resources to support that kind of work is a perennial challenge. The primary source, sorry, the primary source of dollars that are available um, nationwide is through HUD. And as you can imagine, HUD resources are scarce, and they're more scarce than they were last year, and they're more, certainly more scarce than they were 10 years ago. Here in Minnesota, we support the work through, um, through a funding source called Homeownership Education Counseling and Training, HECAP, um, that's funded primarily by the state through Minnesota Housing, but also by our organization, which does private fundraising, Family Housing Fund, and Greater Minnesota Housing Fund. So we have that pool of dollars that supports the work. Is it enough? No, of course we get requests for more support every year than we have money for. Um, but nevertheless, there is a resource to do that. In addition, there is a course called Framework, and that's the online course that we've referred to here. Uh, Framework is about five years old. It has grown in popularity both here in Minnesota and around the country at an astronomical rate in the last two to three years. We are involved in the ownership, development, and maintenance of framework, um, along with another, uh, uh, another um, partner of ours. Last year in Minnesota, 9,000 people took framework online. So the demand for alternative sources of um, program delivery is clear. That's, what, that's one thing we learned from that. Mario, you're absolutely right. There are, there are communities and individuals for whom one-on-one -on -one or in-person is absolutely the way to go. Um, but there's no lack of demand for online support as well. And your real realtors and lenders would tell you, Rochelle is a great, uh, a great uh, spokesperson for us, that uh, in-person is phenomenal as well. But many realtors and lenders look at the classroom education as a barrier to getting a deal done. And when we started developing the online course, we heard a sigh of relief because they thought, all right, I know some of my folks that I'm working with have to take classroom or have to take education. And if there's an online course, that's perceived to be less of a barrier. And it's equally as effective. It's a, it's a, if anybody wants to demo or wants access to it, let me know. And if we get you access to it, just have really positive responses. And as Mary pointed out, it's far easier for us to um, track and reach people who've participated in an online course and we have their access information and we know that they're relatively tech savvy. We can, um, we can create communication patterns with them post-purchase and throughout the um, ownership journey that is far more difficult to achieve with folks that we just see in person. Um, to Casey's point, uh, uh, the Minnesota Housing and us and about 30 other uh, representatives or organizations around the state participate in the Homeownership Opportunity Alliance, which is a cross-sector group that's looking at addressing equitable access to homeownership. So how can we ensure that households of color primarily are um, achieving homeownership in a way that will be sustainable. And we are just now in the process of finalizing a community engagement strategy um, that will first target African-American households in North Minneapolis, 
and move on to the East African community in St. Cloud, and then um, and, and the idea is that we were creating a replicable way to reach an engaged community that we can employ around the state. We should talk about your exciting kickoff event. Yes, and that event will be kicked, or that campaign will be kicked off on May 17th. We're hosting a day-long event here at Minnesota House. It starts at 9 and goes until 3.30. We're anticipating about 150 um, individuals who are interested in this topic of affordable homeownership and equitable access to affordable homeownership. People like yourselves. The invitation will come out in about a week or so. The same day will come out in about a week or so. But um, as part of our community engagement strategy and as, as part of some additional work that we're doing with the Homeownership Opportunity Alliance, we've partnered with the Federal Reserve Bank on some research that enhances research that Minnesota Housing has already done. The president of the Federal Reserve Bank, Neil Kashkari, will be our keynote speaker that day. And we're pretty excited about that. Um, Mr. Kashkari has um, has embraced the Opportunity and Inclusive Growth Institute and initiated that institute at the Minneapolis Fed on behalf of the entire Federal Reserve Bank system. So we're really fortunate that we've got that level of leadership in the lending industry looking at this subject of equitable access. Yeah, at that meeting, we'll be talking about a couple of initiatives that we've been working on for several months. One of them, again, will be the official launch of our campaign to reach out consumer-focused with that messaging that try, and there's a path, and we can help you get there. Um, the other piece is a product mapping um, tool that is looking at all of the, the different resources that really enhances the matrix that um, the Homeownership Center already has on their website. Yeah, we've been focusing quite a bit of time, if I may answer. We've been focusing quite a bit of time on looking at exactly where the products are, both in terms of community availability, um, geographic availability, and demographic availability. And Terry, you bring up an excellent point, or I forget who brought up maybe. Um, but the question of Sharia compliant lending products is one that we're well aware of, that others in the industry are well aware of. It's a little bit of a confounding kind of uh, concern, but there are there, there are folks who are looking at it, and um, we've heard loud and clear. It's really important to organizations that we work with, like the African Development Center, for whom the um, this historical Sharia compliant products that are um, that are available kind of in this community and aren't meeting the needs. Thank you. One of the things that we've been asked as an agency to look at, and we're so I would say in the study stages of it, is the potential for having a source of down payment assistance for Sharia compliant mortgages that would be done by someone that specializes in that field, and we've had a group come and do a presentation for us, and that it, it, it seems that there are beginning to be some uh, investors who are willing to kind of hold and own those loans, um, but there right now is not a good source of down payment assistance to go with those. So. A tangible idea. It's definitely something we've heard a lot. Thank you. Thank you. I don't. I don't want to give everybody the, the impression that we figured this all out. But I wanted to give you some ideas of where there are some uh, initiatives, and I also want to point out the fact that doing all of this um, does cost money. And Casey just came to talk to me the other day about what it's going to cost us to do some of these things. Um, so to the extent that the worker wants to put a marker down on this particular subject area, um, you know, it, I don't think it has to be uh, just 
we'll keep doing what you're doing, but to maybe zero in on a couple of things that you've heard that you think might be particularly effective and you know, indicate you know, that that sounds like something that uh, we should put our shoulders behind. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, to follow up on Mary's point, you know, over within the recommendations, you might have things that are working really well right now, and as is, that are worth noting. Things that are working well but it can't really keep up with the demand, and so you think of priorities to scale those up, additional resources. And then there are things where there are gaps, and then what do you move out the gaps? So you can address all of those. Um, I just had a couple things. Um, I think the consumer-facing events to kind of spark the idea are really good, um, like the one that you're having. Um, there's going to be a NARAP RE event, uh, Home Ownership Expo, that we always get a lot of um, community involvement on. Nonprofits are there, and it really is an opportunity to get that one on one with loan officers, realtors. Um, and it is the, the reaction that you get from people that say, Oh, wow, I can. And I'm glad that I see you, and I know you, you seem like a nice person. Great. Um, the other thing, you know, getting people to the point of home ownership is one issue. Um, and then they come to me and we go and write an offer on a house and there's 15 other offers on the house that just got put on the market today that were, you know, $10,000, $15,000 over all of them. And then, so that's the other reality. So to Mike's original point of what are we doing to solve this problem, the idea of building what we're building, how we're building it. Um, one of the things that I would really like to see is some kind of backing put behind small builders, um, new builders, small builders. Um, the idea of even being a, a new realtor, when you first get licensed, you'll sell anything. You know, it'll take <laughs> it'll take five months. It'll take five months to close a deal, but as soon as you get that paycheck, you feel really victorious no matter how small it is or how long it took, it was a victory. Um, but you won't be able to get you after that. Yeah, and if you just get more familiar, you you know, obviously you're starting from the bottom up, but you're very happy when you're at the bottom to have a victory. It's a victory nonetheless. And so I think that the same is true for builders. If you're going to a builder and, and you know, they're a contractor doing, you know, add-ons, remodels, they're skilled, they can do this, they have a crew. They'd love the opportunity to start building, but they don't have the backing to do it. Um, the permits, the codes, how do you get started to be able to tell them, here's some incentive. It doesn't, and I don't know that it would have to be in lump sums of money, but just here's some here's some incentive, here's some backing, here's a mentor. I don't know. Well, um, but so I think that goes to the education of the builders. You know, and there is a real issue with not having enough new builders and developers moving into market. Unfortunately, you're seeing more and more of the national stakeholder the market scene. And, and it's, I don't know, for lack of a better term, less personal. You know, it's more about the bigger projects. So there, there, I think there is some avenues to encourage, and I think we've written the down already, encourage the entrepreneurs and the young builders and developers. Money's a big deal. I mean, it's typically your builders have to build on whatever lots they can buy. And there's not, you know, where are you going to find a lot for a downtown project or any type of a condo or whatever? That's a big project. Maybe that's something that we could get the state to connect on and say, if you are a builder that has built under this amount or whatever, that will support it until it's built, and then they'll get paid so that they're not going, I don't know. I think it goes people. back to the whole how do you incentivize them to do it? How do you encourage them? Incentivize them and educate them on how to do it. Because there are going to be, you know, I spoke about this earlier. You know, if you want to go back 10 years ago, this wasn't a very attractive industry. You know, we weren't encouraging a lot of people to be a builder developer. Well, a lot of fell out of the market. The you know, security of being in that industry wasn't, wasn't as good. Now it's getting better again, and we need to encourage people to get into it. Wages are going up, and we see that in the cost of housing. I mean, we see some housing costs now, although if you want people involved in housing, you got to pay them. 
So that's going to go up but as it's becoming a better living and you're going to see the entrepreneur step forward now. You know, it's, it's, it's supply and demand. It just takes a while to get there. The complexity, I think, of the industry now with the development, the codes, the licensing and all that is, is tougher. And you're seeing probably less and less actual hands-on carpenters going into the business if you do actual entrepreneurs. So, and who do we encourage? You know, part of me says let's encourage the entrepreneurs as opposed to going out there and grabbing the guys to remodeling and not seeing any good or bad or money they want. But uh, we need that access to capital. They need to take it. It's a huge risk. Real estate building development is just a huge risk. I mean, if the great things are going good, like in 2003, 4, and 5, it could be wrong. You know, and you had a ton of people in the industry. When the bottom fell out, it's 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 a big risk. I mean, a lot of people lost, lost a lot of stuff. Um, and it's going to take a while to get back to that. But I think our communities can probably help with that. The other thing I, I see is as your next affordable product, or to keep product more affordable, is more of the smaller projects, the pocket neighborhoods, you know, the small 10, 20 unit projects, and maybe the density is different. And I saw a neat project that was proposed over in Montclair this morning, a pocket neighborhood that had, uh, what was it, 12 units, and they were going to average. The average price was going to be 225. So I think there's the ability to do that. Um, but it was just on paper. You know, it was a planning company that had started it. How do we get the, the right people in the room that are willing to take the risk? That. And that's where I think of, that's why I made the comparison between realtors and a new builder. A new builder is happy to sort of make his bones making a smaller profit than a large builder that's accustomed to building $500,000 houses that's going to make you know, a larger profit. Why would they go and build a small house? You have to quit saying that. <laughs> <laughs> so just because you're building smaller homes doesn't mean there's a smaller profit, okay? And that's part of the problem is, is Young know, builders think the real money is the million dollar houses. You know, that's not true. I mean, if that was true, Henry Ford would have never built Model T and sold it for $600, right? And built the Empire areas today. So it's, it's not true. It's, but it's a. Uh, why don't big builders build small houses then? Why is there always. Why? I have the least resistance to you heard Rick saying today. I mean, it's what they've always done. There's profit in it, and um, that's, that's what they're going to do. So just as an example, I'll bring up our company because we've, I think we've done a lot for affordable housing in the years. I mean, I've done a big old for 35 years. Last year we closed 143 homes with an average sales price of 266.9. So they're not upper end housing. 39% of our sales were in the telephone market, which was like considerable over the last couple of years. So we're seeing the, the, the sales in the telephone markets and you know, I know this is getting recorded, but um, contrary to popular demand, there's, there's decent profits in the down market because you have a, um, if you want to build in that project, you're the builder. It's not one builder of 10 in the neighborhood that's all competing against each other. So those small, small pocket neighborhoods can maintain the margins as long as they're done properly. So, for example, our company closed quite a few homes, but we did it in one year in 30 different subdivisions. Never having more than 10 units in each subdivision. This is a Rochester market. It's not a small market. But that's the key to it, it's all the small projects. So I told somebody from the city the other day if you're looking for 200 unit projects to solve this issue, is it going to happen? You need 20 to 30 10 unit projects to solve the issue. So that's where you get into this incentivization. I think that would be wonderful to, to encourage and incentivize somebody to do the small projects, the ones that are affordable. You get multiple projects like that. The other thing you have to do is, and this is my opinion completely, is you don't want to do an entire project that's $200,000. You have to have diversity in that project, too. So maybe you have a project that starts at 200 and goes to 400. But I think the, the, the mix of diversity in the housing styles makes it important, too. This is a whole new way of thinking that goes back to education. And I'm sorry, Michelle, I'm going to go back to education for the realtors do. I mean, they think the same way the builders do. You know, a realtor would much rather chase around a $600,000 listing than 
and try to find a builder that will build two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars homes. Long originators are the same way. <laughs> That's, it, it, it's all you know, making your percentage fee, uh, and you think, oh well, you know, if I concentrate on five hundred thousand dollars mortgages, I'm going to make more. But no, your you know, your T example is, is is a good one. Um, can I? So I, I in the interest of time as well, I'm going to push up one piece that I heard um, at a couple of our tables here, and as we're talking about particularly this topic, small neighborhoods. I'm on the board of a local city scene, my neighborhood that's also doing a small homes project, right? And so, um, and so I got some of the, the I'm sorry, the, the big homes, the local communities to do these demonstration projects. Is there, as we think about incentivizing, we can prioritize. I mean, that's our recommendations can prioritize. Would it be so hard to push this for local? One of the things we've heard a lot is outside investors. I'm hearing that's not from Minnesota or coast folks, right? I mean, what is our appetite for that? I'm just pushing as, you know, because we want our recommendations to have good teeth to not just be, oh, what this, and we want education. No, we want innovation. We want if, to move people that think real differently. Sometimes we have to put ourselves out there. So I'm just throwing that out there as. What's that? <laughs> I, you know, I'm glad you raised that, Terry, because we, we have heard that a lot. And one of the thoughts that ran through my mind is, is there any potential at all for partnering with the major investors for a small proportion of lots within a larger development? You know, to at least bring one to the table and just say, is there room for a deal here? I know that um, at various times, Twin Cities Habitat for Humanity has done new construction of townhouses within um, subdivisions that are being developed by a larger developer. And that, that has both pluses and minuses, but it is a model that um, some developers have embraced. And while I agree with you, Mike, that I think there are opportunities for rebuild, you heard Libby talk, for example, about the fact that you're seeing an increasing number of strip malls and shopping centers go out of business. And those will tend to be located in areas that are pretty good for transportation and that sort of thing. And so if that's the path of retail, then do you sort of couple up from a planning basis on look, you know, what's a program that would look for those kinds of sites where it's maybe not super expensive to tear it down because it's pretty inexpensive construction and you've got a well-located site that you can infill with housing. So I think both of those ideas for okay, how do you how do you identify sites, whether they're part of a large development project or kind of these out of the box infill sites that are being repurposed um, to to create the, the land for doing this kind of thing. I think a lot of your cities, your city planners and leaders can identify a bunch of those sites if you go and talk to them. I think there's still a bit of a disconnect between them and the development community. Um, and I think we could probably do a better job of that, you know, connecting those two. You know, I'll just question you a little bit on, um, uh, and this is my personal thought also, if you carve out a chunk of a development and make it all inexpensive housing, you create kind of a bad neighborhood. I shouldn't say bad, but it's not as healthy of a neighborhood as if you intermingle. So it's almost the, the overall idea has got to have them sprinkled with it. Well, and I know with Habitat, what they did was they simply, you know, let's say you were building um, uh, 20 twin homes. They would build four yes. of those 20. So they looked identical to the other twin homes. They just, those were carved out for work of Habitat. You know, that's a mind shift too, we think it Build townhomes. They often look the same. They have to be identical. As a matter of fact, they're as far as the same color and the same kind of plants and the same address numbers on the homes. That's a that's a mind shift also, I think, if we could start building more diversity in the townhomes and create a different, you know, 
better sense of community within the town walls and provide some of that office value in the community. You know, this is still a kind of its infancy. You know, the development community moves slow, it really does. I mean, you heard me talk about it. It takes a while for these things to take on. Change is difficult, change is slow. And it's going to take a while to get some of these new ideas, but I think we get some mechanisms in place to encourage it and give the opportunity. Well, right now, we should have the dialogue yeah. about you know this whole idea of how do you how do you marry potential sites for construction with a, you know a, a more modest cost house construction. I mean, I hear that as a recommendation, actually. Here. Go, 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 encourage new types of partnerships, right? And we really have to think of really creative ways to bring folks together that they wouldn't have done before. Because it's the ideas, and then things happen. You know, you get your test cases, and then things are able to move on. So I, I'm hearing that as like a recommendation that we're amongst many different things. I'm hearing it in our education pieces and our development pieces, too. Um, I want to check the time check. We do have about two minutes before we end. We've, uh, I, there was also, I appreciated Senator Jenkins for, and, you know, looked at this list as well and said this is a good list for us to start with. We've done some moving around on it. Can we talk a little bit about next steps before we um, uh, leave today and before we reconvene in about a month? Barrett or Casey, about what, what you're going to do with all of our kind of thoughts today and where we go forward? Yep, we will organize all of the discussion points and put together a draft that we'll send out to the work group. And then I would recommend that we reconvene and talk about next steps and talk about whether we want to add another meeting in between to do some more discussion, prioritization, and more of a working session. Thank you. Can, can I ask one question of this group? Um, early on, the topic of modular housing came up. Um, I don't see this, I don't see that topic on any of the topic areas. I, I can pick a number of them where it could fit, but if this group doesn't feel you can take that on, I completely understand. I just wanted to mention it as something that I saw as being kind of missing. Yeah, that can be added to topic number five under expanding housing options. It's it's likely that we just missed that as part of the discussion, so we can add that to the topic five area, and then the work group can discuss it when you're when you're hitting the round two topics. You know, I've I've always intended to talk about that too, both modular and analyzed manufacturing. You know, I think it's important that you. In my mind, you put something in place that allows all kinds of innovative ideas because we don't know what's around the corner in you know, 10 years. They might set a giant printer up on a job site and print out all this. So I think it's more important to set up, yeah, I think it's more important to set up a, some sort of a, a avenue to encourage innovative ideas and the last run. You know, in the end, as a developer, I know as well, the market will decide what I will. So it's it's hard for a, I've always had a problem with local leaders saying this is what should be built here without knowing what the market's going to buy. And you're going to have a private investor build it, private contractor, and the market will buy it if it's a good product or if there's a need for it. So I think we have to be careful. I feel I have to be careful saying this product should be used to solve this issue. But provide the avenues to do whatever type of product will work to provide those. You know, it's kind of amazing if you watch the industry over the years how we adapt. We figure out a way how to do it, we figure out a way how to do it efficiently, as long as we're given the avenue to do it. It's not related, but simply ask that we support them. That's the as I that's where we we support the phone scroll. This would be part of it. Or we have to do the phone as it would. So it's my understanding, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, um, that 
this was on the home scroll list as a support. It's actually not the main. It's on the main agenda. Yeah. So we have already supported it. Yeah. Is that? Well, home scroll as Actually, the larger task force at the at the task force meeting number two. I just want to say um, also as far as next steps, um, having a loan officer speak. There's generally um, from Bell Banks that's been at all the meetings, um, and just the idea of being able to have a loan officer talk about what that process looks like. How do you get people? How do you inform people? What does the education look like? Um, that it would be helpful to get some input from you know, some lenders. Yep, and I do want to point out that under one of the topic areas, um, let's see, number four, number nine, all right, number four, which is um, increased access to capital and address their dollars. Yes, and access to capital. It, it was previously development cost and access to capital for developers, but that was refined to remove just developers so that we could also look at the different products, different funding. So I think that will be a great little niche crowdfunding. Like they come up with a lot of different yes. little ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, um, one thought, Casey, and I don't know what you have in mind, but I, I keep wondering if we need, if the work group needs to hear from somebody that finances the development. I was going to work that out. Yep, that's part of the access to. So that is, that, that is one of the topics yep. that you're thinking about. Yep. And one other question I have, um, I felt that today the amount that you heard about um, sort of local regulatory was a little bit minimal. And I wondered if you want to have that on your agenda for more discussion. I mean, you sort of heard about the fees, but you didn't, you didn't really have somebody here to discuss. You, you didn't really get into that discussion. I thought the other topics, you, you got some pretty meaty discussion, but I know that I'm not going to um, pretend that I'm Emily Larson for a minute, uh, since she's giving her State of the City address today and going to be here. Um, you know, she really asked um, for ideas about best practices for cities so that they could go back and look at their fees, city codes, park dedications, things like that. And it, it just strikes me that you might need a little more time or a little more exposure to that topic um, in order to address her concerns that I'm channeling. The group isn't opposed to it, then maybe we can see if we can find time then. Added to a future agenda. Yeah, would it be a actual city, somebody that's uh, part of the administration, or would it be more of a. As a former city planner, maybe just on hiatus, I think it would be really easy to get some people to come and speak to it. Because uh, I think there is a ton that happens at the local level that either supports or prohibits um, adding new units at the volume. Great. Thank everybody. It was a good meeting. We're just coming over, but we'll be reconvening on the internet. If we do need an extra session, we'll be sure to be in touch with y'all very soon to get it scheduled. Thank you. Thank you for everyone who are attending today as well. So. Thank you.